the Pet Health and Happiness Podcast from Bella and Duke, keeping you at the cutting edge of pet nutrition, behavior, and health with expert interviews, myth busters, and more to help your pet lead a healthier, happier life. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode. My name is Rowan Sanderson, and I'm the CNO, Chief Nutritional Officer here at Bella and Duke, and I'm with our amazing super vet friend, Dr. Brendan Clark of the RFVS. This episode, we're going to talk about castration. Dr. Brendan, welcome. Hi, thanks. Hello, everyone. It's quite a complex subject, this, isn't it? So we've talked about it off camera, and I think we're going to split it into four very easy sections for everybody. What, what it is, what it involves, um, why, why you would want to consider it, and what the alternatives are, because often many people present it as an absolute, how it actually happens, and then finally, if you decide to go down this route, the aftercare considerations and some other sort of tips and insights. Uh, does that work for you, Dr. Brandon? Yeah, I think it's a really good way of uh, dealing with the subject. Right, fantastic. So without further ado, what actually is castration and what does it involve? Okay, so castration uh, is neutering of male dogs. Um, it is a removal of the testes, uh, and, and that means entire removal. So there's no just snips, okay? It's not a vasectomy, it's actually removal of the gonads, the two testes uh, from the dog. So that has some implications, and I think we should talk about that um, in, in the following podcast um, you know, that we're going through today. Um, I think the point is that castration is there primarily to remove the testes and the influence that those testes have on your dog. Okay, right, because obviously the testes are the center of testosterone production, have a huge influence, uh, can have a huge influence on health, uh, also on sickness and on behavior. So this leads us into section two of our chat, is why would people be encouraged to do it? And then the second part of this, are what are the alternatives? Okay, so um, it's been around as a, a, a benefit, if you like, for decades now. And, and it's almost become uh, a routine that's talked about primarily to reduce uh, the excess numbers of unwanted puppies, because obviously you've got entire um, animals around, the likelihood of having increased litters is, is there. Um, there's, uh, that's then been justified with talk of reduction of cancers, uh, such as prostate and testicular cancer, obviously, if you're removing the testes, to reduction in prostatitis, so an infl inflammation of the prostate in later life, um, and some of the other complexities around, you know, people will perceive that testosterone is the prime driver for things like aggression, uh, and therefore they believe that, um, you know, removing the testes would make your dog more trainable. Um, and I think we've got to myth bust that a little bit, okay, because it's not entirety, entirely true. There are some complexities to removing the testes, um, otherwise it would be something that would be done across the world. And there are certain countries where they would not encourage castration um, routinely. Um, and that's really important to understand. It is only Western cultures, especially the UK and the USA, that really promote castration as a, a benefit for your dog. Right. Well, this is a really good point. And, you know, thank you for raising that. Because obviously you can see why people would say, oh, it's a socially responsible thing because obviously there's increasing populations of dogs. I know where I live or, or where I'm currently staying here in southern Spain. There's an enormous amount of dogs and especially after lockdown, whenever I'm out walking in the countryside, inevitably I find a stray dog or something else which has been you know, let go of its home. But without going down that route too much, I can see entirely why people would say we need to neuter our dogs to prevent um, you know, an unhealthy growth in the population of dogs. 
I understand that. But to actually say that for the dog's health, we need to remove a body part, that seems to be a little bit counterintuitive because dogs have evolved and they live only because they've reproduced. They're here right now and that's because male dogs had testes. And I'm sure a couple of hundred years ago, not all male dogs with testes got testicular cancer. So can we have a quick dive in into maybe some myths there and what the alternatives are? Yeah, so uh, really important to understand that uh, although it's been talked about for decades and talked to many vets for decades as a benefit, um, it has been proven, you know, in this day of following the evidence, the scientific evidence, you know, of actually looking at that. Um, there is some great work that's been done um, in the, the early 2000s uh, that has actually questioned, is this actually the right thing to be doing? And the evidence is that certain breeds, it actually can have a contrary uh, um, effect and actually cause um, bodies to be predisposed to certain types of cancer. So in the SPAY podcast, we talked a little bit about um, the increase in osteosarcomas in Rottweilers. And you know, this is really important to understand. If you've got a Rottweiler that is neutered before puberty, so castrated before puberty, um, you can increase the frequency of osteosarcoma from about a 7% um, uh, rate up to nearly 27%. That's nearly a third of Rottweilers will be predisposed to osteosarcoma if you castrate them early. Uh, and that's from the evidence that has been brought forward. And on the basis of that, there's uh, a number of other diseases uh, that can be a problem. You know, we noticed increased levels of cruciate disease. Uh, that's a joint disease where the, the ligament within the knee can rupture. Um, that's also been allocated to um, early castration. Um, so there's a number of issues that can come about from uh, castrating dogs early. And this was discussed, um, you know, the papers were discussed um, two, three years ago at the World Small Animal Veterinary Association over in Denmark. Um, and uh, it was really interesting that even though it's out there in the veterinary domain, I still see many, many vets just ignoring that evidence um, and saying, well, we've always castrated. So that's the only message that we'll get across to the client. Well, this is a really good point. And I think, you know, if somebody was to take maybe the essence of what we're trying to do with these podcasts and these Mythbusters and these shows, it's question things which have been repeated. Because quite often things get repeated and they get repeated and often with the very best intent, a classic being fruit is good for you. Everybody repeats it and they assume it's correct. Well, for instance, if you're diabetic and you're susceptible to lots of sugars, whether it's fruit sugar or another, a lot of fruit is not going to benefit you. This is not medical opinion, this is mine, but basically we need to question things which get repeated just, just, the, just because they are heard often and repeated often, whether it's by ourselves, by vets, doesn't necessarily mean they're true. Um, so really the purpose of this podcast, apart from me getting rid of this fly, which keeps trying to balance on my head is to get information out there and empower people so that they can make an informed decision and at least give them the confidence to ask the vet and say, right, okay, is there an alternative to this so that you can weigh up the options rather than being painted into a corner of truisms or medical opinion or fear? and taking a decision simply because you think it's the only option. Yeah, uh, and I think um, it's really good to say, look, for dogs with behavioral issues, um, sometimes castration can actually heighten fear aggression rather than actually reducing it. Um, and you know, you've got to be really careful about the anesthetics that are used in those, uh, the circumstances under which they then um, you know, go through any operation. Um, there's, there's a choice to be made there. 
um, there is a choice to be made as to whether you do a vasectomy rather than a castration. So if it's all about reducing the number of unwanted puppies, then vasectomy is a, a valid option. Yes, it may still cost the same as a castration, but it's just a case of removing a, a section of the, the vas deferens, the tube that carries the semen um, uh, within the groin area, and then leaving the testes to do their hormonal thing. Because it's not just testosterone. You know, there's estrogens are still released from those organs for dogs. And that has a balancing effect of all sorts of elements uh, to do with, you know, where hormones will affect metabolism, where hormones will affect, you know, the, the mental well-being of that patient, but also anti-cancer properties that those hormones also have. So to recap, I think it's really important for people to be able to discuss what the alternatives are, knowing that ultimately all of these hormones exist naturally for a reason and they serve a purpose. Just because they're there doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad. Quite often they've been there for evolution and health reasons. So Brendan, what would you advise people to ask their vets and what do they need to bear in mind? Yes, I think it's really important that you understand that any anaesthetic can have an effect on the behavior. You know, many people are doing this to, to try and help the behavior uh, of their, their dog. Um, and I would say, look, remember, especially with things like fear aggression, you know, certain operations can, can accentuate that. And that's sometimes not just because of the operation, like castration, but actually because of the anesthetics that are used. So having that discussion with your vet as well as to which drugs they're using, what effects they may have, especially if you have a dog which is predisposed to behavioral issues. <clears throat> so that's number one. Can I just ask a question on that? I'm sorry to interrupt the yep. flow, but I think this is really important to kind of contextualize for people. And this is it. Testosterone will effectively embolden and give your dog confidence. So if we're removing the source of that testosterone, any fear-based aggression can be made worse. So I think maybe when people look at castration and they're talking to their vet, if the population control is not an issue, why is it we're, we're looking at castration? Is that valid, Brendan? Look, the, the testes produce also estrogens as well. So it has yep. a balancing effect. Um, and actually, it's not often that the hormone is responsible directly for the aggression. You know, although you know, they, they feel that castrating an animal will reduce some of the testosterone overdrive, the red mist that comes in when they're competing for a bitch in season, um, actually... There are other issues, and these are more immediate, because if it was just down to the hormones, <clears throat> then it would take a good month for those fear-aggressive issues to start emerging post-castration, because uh, it takes time for those hormones to come out of the system. We often see that actually the fear-aggression can be heightened within hours of being castrated and coming round from the anaesthetic. So we see drugs <clears throat> which are now stopped, you know, that many behaviorists will tell you they will not want to see ace promazine used as a sedative for fear situations such as firework phobias, because all it does is it paralyzes your dog from being able to move when they are actually able to sense everything that's going on around them. So oh, wow. Fearful in a, a strange environment with around them step to a station where they may be restrained so they can have an anesthetic etc and all they've had is um, a pain relief and ace promazine then effectively they could be really really scared under those circumstances and that can accentuate the fear situation they don't forget that very easily and that could mean that when they go back to the vets they're in a more fearful situation so as a veterinary surgeon we don't use acepromazine routinely anymore because and we've not for the past 20 years plus because we recognize that that's not a great drug for dogs which are fearful okay well that's a really good point i think um understanding 
what your vet proposes to use and why you're proposing to do it. And also this echoes and resonates with us because uh, we've got a great natural canine behaviorist who you know, who works with us at Bella and Duke, uh, Caroline Spencer, and she often advocates before you go down the castration route to affect behavioral issues, try working with a behaviorist and see if you get results with that. Because she often thinks, agrees entirely with you, Brendan, that there are behavioral interventions which are better and more effective uh, than hormonal ones or surgical interventions. Yeah, and not to fall out of my um, you know pattern of talking about microbiome. You know, we've talked about uh, in some of the other podcasts about the L-tryptophan and the increasing serotonin levels uh, that is there, and those are actually things that you should be considering uh, before your uh, pet goes in for an operation if they have any signs of fear. Um, situation, you know, behavioral issues, um, because that can really help them settle and become less fearful prior to any procedure and means that their visit to the vet can be a much more pleasurable experience for all involved. Okay. Well, this is great intel, Brendan. Thank you. In terms of uh, alternatives or why you might consider concentration, are there any other points we need to cover or do we move on to the next section? Well, I think, you know, we didn't really address some of the issues around the um, why castration is now deemed not necessarily to be the number one thing that you should be doing for your entire male dog um, if there are some concerns, um, so uh, especially about unwanted litters. There is something called a vasectomy, which is a removal of a piece of the tube from the groin of the vas deferens, that's the tube that carries the semen. Um, and that, unlike just a snip, it's actually removing a section of that, tying it off. So there's very unlikely to be a reversal uh, of that procedure. But it al allows the hormones to still be active. And why is that important? Those hormones can have massive anti-cancer properties. Um, you know, the, the studies that were out there showing about, you know, uh, the osteosarcoma um, in Rottweilers, there were then studies about hemangiosarcoma in uh, German shepherds, which is a blood vessel tumor, often affects the spleen. Um, the, uh, the issues around lymphoma in golden retrievers were studied. The issues around transitional carcinoma in cocker spaniels was studied, you know, all of these have direct uh, relationships with, um, if you remove the gonads, um, you get an increased spike in what we call TSH, which is a stimulating hormone that the brain is trying to go into overdrive to replace the hormone that's now lacking. Um, and that seems to predispose the body to increased cancers of those sorts. And whereas we can easily feel for testicular cancer, it's on the outside. Um, we can't feel easily for the tumors that I've just talked about until that it's too late. And these are far more aggressive and devastating types of cancer than testicular cancer um, in many, many situations. So I would say it's far easier to do a vasectomy and then continue to monitor carefully your male dog um, to make sure that the testes are normal in shape, okay? And you know, just as any good man should be checking themselves, you can check your dog, um, and make sure that that's all okay, and make sure at the health check that they have with the vet that everything is okay. But you can't necessarily spot osteosarcoma or hemangiosarcoma or lymphoma until it's already spread through the body. Wow, this is really, really good intel. And frankly, it's common sense. I mean, reading between the lines, what we're saying is we could mistakenly be removing the testes to prevent a cancer, which is one, less likely, and two, very easy to spot. And I'm guessing the next part to this is if at a later age your dog did get testicular cancer, it's very easy to remove the testes then. Whereas by removing them, we're, we're potentially predisposing the dog 
to other much more vicious and difficult to spot cancers. Is this correct? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, look, at the end of the day, this is all about informed consent, making sure that you are fully aware of all of the facts when you're talking to your vet and make the right decision for your dog and yourselves in those circumstances. Um, and I think as long as you're having a discussion and you're raising these elements of the evidence that's out there, okay, so this is not just my opinion, this is evidence that's been put before the whole profession, um, then you can make an informed choice and make the right choice for, for the pair of you. Yeah, okay, great, great stuff. Brendan, thank you so much. That's insightful, it's common sense, and it's refreshing to hear something rather than it being repeated dogmatically as a truism to actually say, okay, well, here are the facts that we know so far. And we know that science is full of facts which change on a weekly basis uh, as we learn more and evolve more. But the weather report we have right now is one that there are alternatives. If your dog is aggressive, it might be due to other things than, than hormones uh, or testosterone. And we've got a vasectomy, which could be a good way of maintaining uh, a, a break in the dog population whilst allowing the health benefits and balance of the hormones that your dog's testes produce. Um, not to mention the cancer things, which we've already covered. Okay, shall we move on to the next part? And I think we've really covered the how, is assuming that actually castration is the best way for you to go and it's something you want to do for your dog. What are the considerations uh, when recovering from an operation? So firstly, more or less, how long would recovery from such an operation take? Okay, so generally, um, uh, recovery from an operation, whether that be vasectomy or castration, should pretty much be uh, within 10 days. Okay. Uh, so often the procedure will uh, be in for the day. Uh, they'll be coming home to you that evening. Um, and, you know, bar barring uh, complications such as a bleed or something like that that can cause swelling. Uh, you often hear from men that have had vasectomies that they'll suddenly get swelling in the uh, scrotal area and things like that. And that can happen. It's, it's a risk, okay? Um, but barring that, most dogs... I would say 90% plus will go home. They'll be asked to rest for at least three days, just whilst the skin wound heals. Yeah. Um, be try and avoid licking it. Okay, so they may be given a collar, they may be given a, a, a jacket, a medical pet shirt to cover the wound. Uh, all sorts of options there. Um, talk to your vets about those, or the, the veterinary nurse that's discharging um, your your dog, and just. You know, discuss making sure that they, they don't interfere with the wound because that could introduce uh, bacteria and swelling and inflammation. Um, yeah. That they're comfortable um, with pain relief as appropriate um, and that really they're rechecked at three days to just make sure that everything's on track. And pretty much your dog, you'll probably have to restrain your dog because your dog will be thinking, do you know what, I want to go back running in the park. And actually what you need to be doing is saying to say, please, just for the next 10 days, take it easy, make sure that everything is okay, um, that the wound is fully healed, um, stitches are out at 10 days if they're not absorbable ones under the skin, um, and then they'll be back to normal exercise thereafter, pretty much at 10 days, uh, if everything's gone well, they can be running around without any problems whatsoever. Okay, well that's, that's good to know and I think quite often we get hypnotized by our animals into uh, you know, acquiescing to their demands or those lovely kind of chocolate brown eyes. I want to go and run in the park when really, and you say, oh, it's been really difficult but they love that and I just want to indulge them. Actually, just being firm on this and allowing them to heal properly is much better for the both of you in the long term. Um, the next part, so exercise really a minimum of 10 days. Uh, what about bathing your dog after this uh, operation? How long before you should consider bathing your dog? 
Okay, well, careful bathing can happen, you know, uh, almost immediately because you, the wound will have been stitched closed. You know, they're not left with an open wound. Okay. Um, I, I think it's just a case of would you submerge them? Would you send them for hydrotherapy, for example? And I would say definitely at least wait till um, the three day mark, which is usually when the skin heals. And as long as the nurse or, or vet has advised you, look, the wound is healed, you can now allow them to, to go to one of those things of, of either being bathed um, you know, in a bath or being uh, going to hydrotherapy, which the, the pool is controlled as far as you know, chlorination uh, of the waters, et cetera. Um, which reduces bacterial numbers. I still wouldn't let them swim in the lake locally or anything like that. Um, Understood. Sea. Um, but I would certainly say um, those other controlled mechanisms could be used as, as close as three days. But you know, if your vet has advised you, look, it's not 100%, then I would say by 10 days, absolutely. 10 days, I would say, is your lovely cutoff uh, point of which everything should have healed. They'll be absolutely fine to go swimming um, and be bathed, you know, have a proper shampoo and everything. Okay. What other considerations should we be factoring in for aftercare? And if you think that I've just teed you up for one of your other passion points being bone broth, maybe I have. <laughs> well, I was going to, let me just say, look, um, we talked about welfare because it is so important when you're, you're talking about welfare. And there are some countries uh, especially in Europe that will say you cannot do a routine neutering uh, like this unless it's indicated for that animal uh, because it will impinge upon their welfare and I would say you know that they you know so for, for Denmark for, for the Netherlands you know they all have that policy in place so be aware of, of that if you're watching this from Europe uh, that you know there may be differences of what you are allowed to do the welfare issues they will be sent home with appropriate pain relief now they will have had some pain relief during the operation some of that can be an opioid base so very much uh, you know opium um, so methadone morphine those sort of things can have different effects on different dogs uh, so some of them uh, that they use, so we see with buprenorphine, which is in Betagedic, can have some effects where the dogs, instead of just having a lovely pain relief level, can actually have some bad trips. They'll see the little green men hanging from the curtains, or they'll be, you oh, know, wow. um, uh, that, yeah, and just as with people, they will have different psychotic effects. And that could mean that your dog could be panting a lot could be slightly distressed, could be whimpering, could be wandering the room, pacing, not able to settle, yet doesn't seem to be painful around the wound area. Uh, and that is often misconstrued as they're in pain when actually it's just their reaction to the medication. So right. what's sorry for medication reaction? Right, Brendan, I think this is really important. You've, you've raised a really salient point here. Can you tell us what this medication is again? And what we'll do is we'll make sure we put it in the show notes for people so they can ask their vet what uh, aftercare medication they're getting. Okay, so we're talking about opioids, okay, yep. so everything from morphine to buprenorphine, okay. Okay. Um, now, they are really good pain reliefs, and for the majority of dogs, they're really, really useful, okay, and they're given in the operation. But there is a minority of cases where they could have a reaction which could lead to them panting, being restless, seeing things that aren't necessarily there. If you're unfortunate enough to experience that with your dog it is worth talking to your vet about the fact they're seeing some of these side effects and that it's not used in future but i would say for the majority it's really good that they use an appropriate pain relief okay for the welfare of the dog okay thank you okay um so in terms of other concepts or other factors for aftercare what would be your top three so my top three aftercare, look, for good healing recovery, they need a really good protein source, something that's really easily digestible. So often vets will talk about, well, here's a can of something that's really easily digestible. 
Um, and I've got many clients that are raw food feeding are questioning why their vet has asked them to, to feed something that's not their normal diet. And that's often because the vets aren't perceiving what you're feeding. And I think if you're on a good raw diet, there is no reason whatsoever why you can't give a good raw diet immediately after. Just give small meals initially just so that you can make sure they're out of any post-operative nausea um, and then into their normal feeding. Maybe not so much bone material initially, but just a good protein source that's great for healing. Encourage the microbiome because if they've given any other medications which has upset the stomach, um, then you know again from anesthetics all the way through to uh, antibiotics that may or may not have been used by your vet. These days, many vets are advised not to give antibiotics for a routine procedure because they should be sterile enough within the operation to not require antibiotics. Okay. Um, so, but all of those can affect the microbiome. And so making sure that your dog is being fed a really good diet, so back to your raw, but they're also having maybe some bone broth to enhance the gut flora, even some probiotics. I know you've got Phytospore out there, um, which is really great you know, for these post-stress situations. Um, but there's all sorts of fermented veg options, you know, kefir, things like that, that could be used in those circumstances. So number one, protein. Okay, really good source of protein. Number two, protect that microbiome, uh, reducing stress and everything else to, to the gut flora. That will help their recovery. Okay, number three, just keeping them with appropriate levels of exercise, rest and recuperation. So R&R &R is really good post-operatively. Brilliant. Brendan, that's a lovely, neat summary. So what we're saying, just to recap, is you, know, you can continue raw feeding because obviously it's the, we believe, the best source of quality protein. And in fact, there's uh, plenty of papers come out from Dr. Anna Hjelm Bjorkman at the University of Helsinki, which shows that your dog absorbs more of the protein from raw food than from cooked food. That's because it's more bioavailable potentially a probiotic. And as we've seen with the Fido spore from those very clever people in microbiome labs, uh, that can have an antibacterial effect whilst promoting the positive gut flora and appropriate levels. So a bone broth, obviously, because it's you know, amino acids in a very digestible and easily accessible form. And finally, and this is essential, appropriate levels of rest and recovery because your dog's body is basically going to be repairing what's something which is quite an invasion and it's going to need time space and resources for all those tissues to knit together in a really healthy fashion absolutely yeah that's a, a really good roundup of, of what we should be looking at fantastic well dr brendan thank you again for your time we're going to put some appropriate links uh, in the below and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next episode when we've got some more exciting topics to follow up on. Now, for all of you who've enjoyed this podcast, please, please comment, rate, share us. We're here to empower you to make some informed decisions about your pet's wellness. We're passionate. We're on a mission. Please come and join us. And don't forget to come and join the Facebook group uh, at Bella and Duke, the Raw Feeding Pack. Uh, we are out there absolutely determined <laughs> to be the most welcoming and informative raw feeding group on Facebook. Uh, no question is too small. So even if you're not raw feeding, but you basically want to find out a little bit more, come and ask some questions and help contribute to the community. We're here to help. On that note, Brendan, thank you once again. Thank you for all of the insights, all of your boffinness, and uh, <laughs> we value and appreciate you. And uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Great, thank you.